I've been a long time admirer of the work and ministry of Dr. West Stafford. The reason being he not only understands the value of every child, but he understands the importance of those in positions of trust and responsibility, doing everything that they can to protect those children. Dr. West has a powerful personal and professional story to tell. And whilst in the UK, he's agreed to spend some time with us to share both his wisdom and his insights. Well, I am, uh, I have become a warrior, a bit of a champion uh, for children. And I guess most of us who feel strongly about things have a reason for that. And my reason goes back, uh, yeah, international, goes back to my, uh, to my childhood. Any given year of my childhood was split between two settings. One of them was a poverty-stricken little village in the Ivory Coast of West Africa. People as poor as church mice, uh, but with huge big hearts. And children mattered in that poverty-stricken village. I used to have a saying, it takes the whole village to raise a child. And I was one of the lucky kids, wrong color skin, obviously, in West Africa. But I was one of the kids that everybody thought belonged to everybody. So when I was a little guy in the village, I never fell down and hurt myself without some African woman you know, swooping in, picking me up, drying, drying my tears. It was a poverty-stricken place, and uh, by the time I was 15 years old and came to America to finally live, half of my boyhood friends uh, had died. So among the things that I fight hard as president of Compassion, you might imagine, is poverty. I know what it does to children. I know uh, why it needs to be attacked. Now, on the other side of every year, was another setting. It was for nine months out of every year. Uh, it was mission policy that all missionary children uh, had to go to one boarding school in West Africa. It was 700 miles away. It took us a week to drive there. Uh, it, was a, it, was, it was hard to be away from our parents, as you can imagine, for nine months. The worst thing about that wasn't, about, wasn't just being away from our parents, but the people that were put in charge of us First of all, weren't called to work with children, didn't want to work with children, weren't trained to work with children. Uh, nobody held them accountable. Uh, what I learned in that setting was that when children are considered unimportant, terrible things uh, can happen. We became, the little ones became a second-rate mandate to the mission effort of bringing Africans uh, to Christ. And I admire that missionary community. I admire my own parents who were passionate about that. But it came at a huge cost to 50 of us little missionary children who were basically warehoused uh, far, far uh, away. Never saw our parents in the course of that time, never saw anybody of the missionary community other than those put in charge of us. So it was tough to be gone, but the hardest part was the people responsible for us didn't want the job. They didn't go to Africa to take care of children. They went to Africa to, to win souls. Now what happened, I don't know for sure, but what happened is they didn't make it linguistically or cross-culturally. And instead of being fired, they were simply given the lowest priority job you can have, then go take care of other missionaries' kids. And they were angry, they didn't want to be doing this, and uh, nobody holding them accountable, they just took out their rage. The school teachers, the dorm parents, on 50 of us little kids. It was a scary, horrible place to be a child. It was a cacophony of, 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 of the crack of belts, the, the, the pleading of children. Uh, lunch hour was, uh, the noon rest hour was just uh, like, a, like a Gestapo. When I was nine years old and they taught us math, the most reoccurring thing I could think of to do on the averaging was uh, how many times do they beat me in this place? And I did the tally under my pillow for a few weeks and then did the math. I was being beaten 17 times a week, sometimes to the point where you could hardly walk. It was physical abuse. It was spiritual abuse. We were scared to death of these guys' God. 
Uh, I knew I was a horrible sinner. Why wouldn't they? Why would they be beating me if I wasn't a horrible little sinner? And so I, I when I prayed, I thought of, please don't look at me, God. I know I'm. I know I'm not worthy for you to look at me. I was scared to death of God. Physically beaten on every day, basically. Uh, emotionally, I was terribly scarred. I tried not to make eye contact with grown-ups because nothing good could come of an encounter with a grown-up. Uh, and then anytime those kinds of evils are in place, of course, sexual abuse is in place. And, and us little kids were, uh, were, were sexually abused. Not some wayward weekend with a crazy priest. This was every day for nine months out of the year. The very people who had read us our Bible stories, the very people who should have been the ones we run to for protection, were the ones who were abusing us. Up and down the girls' hall, up and down the boys' hall. Older boys who had been, had been abused themselves. Wounded spirits picked up the same pattern of behavior. And so it was a scary place to be a little tiny little guy. I guess I should tell you one more thing that was probably the, the worst of it all. They bought our silence by warning us, don't you dare tell your parents what happens in this place. Even though we wrote letters every week, we didn't tell. And they warned us, because if you do, you will be Satan's tool to destroy their ministries in Africa. And there will be Africans in hell because of you. And with our love for God, our love for our parents, and our love for the village, people back home. Uh, we went silent. We wrote letters. I've got boxes full of letters at my house talking about everything except that I got beaten 20 times this week or this is what they're doing to me, mom and dad. Even the three months that we were home, they warned us, don't tell. We're not here to control that. But if you tell, uh, nothing changes. There will still be Africans in hell. And us little ones, we bought that. We became silent like lambs in the midst of all of this. So when you take my childhood and you see a village that was nurturing and, and precious but poor, uh, poverty became my enemy. And when you take a boarding school filled with evil, uh, then abuse became my enemy. And I have merged these two together in the course of my life. I understand poverty, I understand abuse, and I can tell you what, the worst thing about both of them is what it does on the inside of a child's heart. Both of them speak the same language, the same words, they come from the very same source. And the words are, give up. Nobody cares about you. Nobody's coming to your rescue. You don't matter. And when a little child believes that, the sparkle in their eye goes out, Satan rejoices, and he knows that if he can destroy them when they're small, he doesn't have to worry about what they do with the rest of their life. Well, he wound up having to worry about me because I discovered something called forgiveness. And even though these people never apologized, I chose not to carry them with me in my heart the rest of my life. I chose to forgive them. I remember 17 years old in America for the first time. I was out of everything. I didn't know the jokes, didn't know how to dress. I was completely a third culture kid way out there when somebody first explained forgiveness to me, and I will never forget what happened in my heart. They said, you know, some of you have been really, really hurt. Nobody uh, has ever said they're sorry. They, they may never, they may not even remember what they did to you. So you're the only one paying the price. You're letting them live in your heart rent free. And there's only one way out of that, and that is forgive them, let them go. You don't have to carry them. And I remember thinking, I was sitting at a, at a campfire, and I remember thinking, all right, you people, I know you're not sorry. I know you'll never apologize. I refuse to carry you forward in my life, so I choose to forgive you. Now get out. Get out of my heart. Get out of my life. You stole my childhood. You cannot have the rest of my life. You took my past, my future. You cannot have. Now just get out. It wasn't real noble forgiveness. It was the best I could muster up a very wounded spirit. Since then, I've learned a lot about forgiveness. And I have been able to, uh, to take the hurt and the pain that all but destroyed me and use that same passion, that same drive to now fight for children. And that's what I do at Compassion. And that's why I'm honored to, to be a part of what you guys are doing. You don't get closer to the kingdom of God, the very center of God's heart, than what you're doing. I'm absolutely convinced of that.
you know, I'm, I'm convinced that nothing breaks the heart of God like when a little child is abused. I believe that there's a battle that rages over our heads between heaven and hell over each child. I believe that Satan only has one agenda on his mind and that is to break God's heart. And I think that he watched creation uh, all the way through the days of water and light and plants and animals and on day six, uh, he discovered the chink in God's armor and that was when God made man. And I think Satan watched on and said, hmm. He didn't just speak him into existence, he actually breathed him into, fashioned him with his own hands. And if I'm going to break God's heart, what I'm going to do is attack what he loves most. Now, when's the best time to attack? And I believe he discovered he's not stupid. The, or, the earlier, the better. The sooner, the better. I maintain that that's why the womb has become, you know, the most dangerous place on the planet to be a child, either from poverty or from convenience. Uh, just surviving the womb is a hard thing. And that's part of this battle, I believe, that rages over our heads, over, over each and every child. I can look at the, uh, the path back into my childhood and I, um, I realize now that I must have had a bullseye this big on my chest. I don't know what Satan knows. I don't know if he can see into the future, but if he sensed that somehow I was going to become an instrument in God's hands that would fight for children, that would champion children, then of course he came at me with everything that, uh, that he could have at me. I used to wonder while I was keeping my little tally under my pillow about the, how much abuse I was going through, I used to wonder, so where's my guardian angel? You know, when I scream for mercy into my pillow, why? Why doesn't, um, why doesn't my guardian angel protect me? Now I can look back and I can think, you know what? I think my guardian angel must have run to God every time and said, don't you see, don't you feel what's going on? And I think now in retrospect, I can hear God say, I do. I feel every lash. I feel all of the hurt. I feel all of the abuse. But I'm building something here. He is going to need this in order to do what I call him to do. And I can accept that as God's amazing grace, amazing what he can redeem. If he can use me in his kingdom, I am convinced he can use absolutely anybody. So this evil that we see uh, in our own countries, um, it's the same evil, it's the same enemy, it's the same battle over our heads raging all across our world. And we have to understand that in any society, anywhere in the world, anything that ultimately is wrong, the ills of society ultimately spiral downward and they land on the heads of our weakest, most vulnerable citizens. It's true in Africa, it's true in the United Kingdom, it's true in America, Australia, everywhere in the world. Whatever is wrong with society, children wind up paying the price for it. You know, when adults are hungry, children are the ones who actually starve. When adults get sick, children actually die. More children, uh, you know, die in our natural disasters than, than anyone else. Our worst sins, I don't care what the culture is, the worst sins, our sins of commission, doing the things that we know we shouldn't do, uh, children pay the price. Uh, pornography, at its sickest, is child pornography. Uh, prostitution at its most disgusting is child prostitution. Uh, you know, more children killed in our wars fighting over lines in the sand and the color of skin than soldiers. Um, 27 million slaves today, way more than back when Wilberforce did his great fight against slavery. There's 27 million of them today and most of them are in uh, the most disgusting kind of slavery there is, the, the sex trafficking. Uh, we don't buy slaves anymore by how big and strong they are, how much cotton can they pick. We buy them by how weak and vulnerable they are and how easily can we take advantage of them. So in this battle across the world, children are paying the price for our worst sins. But here's where it gets close to us. They also pay the price for our sins of omission, not doing the things that we know we should do. When we allow them to be hurt and we turn our heads, when we allow them to be a second-rate mandate in our missions efforts, in our church efforts, uh, when we allow them 
to pay the price for our broken marriages and we watch them blame themselves. Maybe mommy and daddy would still be together if I'd been a good little girl or if I'd cleaned my room. They pay the price for all of that, our sins of commission, our sins of omission. And this is why the scriptures say so clearly, so speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. Children don't vote, children don't tithe. They are out of the power uh, structure that, uh, that can influence their lives. They don't know how to lobby. They don't know how to demonstrate. I mean, have you ever seen a children's protest march? No, every segment of society has learned how to fight for themselves, but not children. So they got no voice, they got no resources, they got no organization, they're uneducated by definition, and all of the evils spiral down onto them. Therefore, it is the place of those of us who have survived childhood. If you've lived to be 18 years old, you're an expert in this field. You should have an honorary doctorate in childhood. I mean, you have done 18 years of very complicated field research in this. It's not like we need to know any more than we need to know. We just need to have the courage to step up and fight for those uh, who are hurting. So if you're running an organization across uh, the world in multiple cultures, multiple settings, uh, you've got to find out what is going on in the lives of children. You've got to recognize that almost everywhere they are a second-rate mandate. They are a low priority to the government, to the church, to missions. You know that most missions spend less than 10% of their effort on children. 85% of people who accept Christ as their Savior do it while they're children between the ages of 4 and 14. I don't know, I'm not a rocket scientist, uh, but if we're going to bring in this world as a harvest to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we need a paradigm shift. we got to understand that they matter when they're small, that the cement of their spirit is impressionable and it takes no effort to make an impression that lasts a lifetime. And I maintain that if God stands you in front of a child for as little as one minute, it very well could be a divine appointment. You might be the one to say the right thing, do the right thing that launches that child's life. On the other hand, if you don't, you miss the opportunity to maybe be the one to create that memory that would have launched that child on a totally different trajectory. The village was right. They belonged to all of us. And any of us who have been through childhood or are in positions now of authority, either as communicators or running organizations, have a mandate to speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. Figure it out. Where God has planted you, figure it out. Champion the cause of kids. Do not let them be a second-rate mandate. Well, I've been at this for 35 years. Uh, I lead a worldwide ministry that touches the lives of over a million and a half children now in uh, 6,800 church locations. So what have I learned uh, over these years? I've learned that the priority of children, the protection of children uh, absolutely starts at the top. People can read the heart of a president, the heart of a CEO. Uh, they know what really, really matters. Amazingly, they, uh, they behave based on what they know. And so the board, the president, the executive team of the mission, the store, whatever uh, you're leading, uh, people take their, their cues from the, from the top. If you're leading anything, you have to recognize, especially in, within the kingdom of God, uh, you are under attack. Uh, you've got a bullseye that big on your chest and you've got to be walking close to God. You've got to be aware of, uh, of the spiritual battle uh, going on around you. You've got to understand that every child, I mean, every child matters. Again, if God puts a child in front of you for a minute, you've got a divine appointment, something that you ought to maybe be doing that could launch that child's life. Of course, as leader, you've got to put the, uh, the policies in place. You've got to put the procedures in place. You've got to have curriculum. Uh, you've got to hold people accountable. 
I lead uh, 6,800 church locations within Compassion. That's over 50,000 people engaged in children's lives every day. They are all trained. They are all uh, signing commitments to, uh, to care about children. Uh, and it doesn't go up on the shelf. It, uh, it's lived out day by day. And I think that's the responsibility you've got to have. I would encourage you that as you hire, hire people if they're gonna be working with children that are called to work with children. Uh, if they're not called to work with children, find something less important <laughs> for them to do. Uh, but if you sense that they're called to work with children, then you get them trained, you get them uh, supported, you get them encouraged, uh, you be there for them. And, uh, and, and give them every opportunity to live out uh, their calling. I would encourage you, for those who are frontline people who work with children, be there, care for the caregivers. It is hard, hard work. And they too have bullseyes on their chest. Other things I've learned, I guess, is listen to the children, uh, give them a safe haven where they know they can talk to someone that they can trust. Every child deserves to be known, loved, and protected. And I believe it's the responsibility of, uh, of leadership to assure that that is the culture uh, of the organization. I believe that the church is uniquely poised in the world today uh, to be the kind of salt and light that, that transforms society. I think when things are the darkest is when the light shines the brightest and uh, the church is uniquely poised. I, you go across the world and uh, in every community across the world, I don't care how poor it is, there is usually the presence of a body of Christ. There is a presence of a, of a church grouping in that place with a mandate to be compassionate, to care, with a mandate to speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. I encourage you, get to know the authorities where you are working, uh, get to know the environment, what are the customs, what are the cultures as it goes uh, around children, what are the resources available to children in need. Uh, get to know the authorities, first of all, of course, the laws that they are supposed to be upholding. Get to know the authorities, get to know them as a body of Christ before there's a crisis. Build relationships with these guys so that when something begins to go wrong, you've already got an ally, somebody who understands who you are, what you're trying to do in that setting. And uh, most natural thing in the world is to, to run to them as the secular authority and then work with them to bring about protection or ultimately justice if that's, uh, if that's necessary. There's so much to, uh, to know uh, when it comes to uh, fighting and protecting children, uh, but those are some of the things that I recognize. And I work in 28 countries um, across many, many cultures, and uh, I hope some of that's helpful. You know, um, the spirit of a child is uh, easily impressionable. Uh, it's a lot like soft clay or, or wet cement. It doesn't take any effort at all. It doesn't take any time at all to make an impression that uh, may last a lifetime. I maintain that anytime you see a little child, uh, you should grab your hard hat, your tool belt, your steel-toed shoes because you are in a construction zone and you ought to be asking yourself, so what is God building here? And is there anything that I can help? Or is there anything that I can remove the barriers to this uh, child becoming all that they can become? Uh, I, be I believe if God stands a child in front of you for as little as a minute, it's a divine appointment. Uh, you might be the one to say the right thing, do the right thing that launches a child's life. And I wrote in a, in a book I wrote recently, just a minute, I wrote, in the heart of a child, a minute can last forever. And Graham Greene said it even better, I think. He said, in every childhood, there's a minute where the door opens and lets the future in. You never know when you're working with children or if there's a child around you, when their antenna are up, when you are making a lifelong memory. So what I did in that book uh, was basically tell the story of 68 people who could remember the minute. And I would wonder, uh, those of you who care about children, good chance uh, that if we went around the room and asked you, so why is it you care? 
you probably could come up with a story. There's somebody that you owe, somebody that said something, did something that launched your life. Someone said, my, but you're a beautiful little girl and you have felt like a beautiful person every time you've looked in the mirror. Or someone said, my, but that was a kind thing you did. You gave the biggest half of the cookie to that other child and you have done that all your life. You love being generous. Or God made you strong and you love opening the doors. Or it's rare that I pass a child in, the, in a grocery store helping their mother that I don't stop and say, my, look at you helping your mother. What a, what a big helper you are, that's so cool. I believe that um, we can do that. Uh, we don't need one more day of training, we can do that. Now the sad part, and those of you who know my story from earlier, the sad part is you can destroy the life of a child uh, just as fast. And if we went around the room and said, so who almost destroyed you? Who said you're ugly and that's how you have felt all your life? Or who said you're always wrong and now, I don't know, you gotta win every argument? Or someone said, you're so stupid and now you got three PhDs and you wondered, why did I do that? Uh, oftentimes it goes back to that moment in childhood. Good chance that the negative moment was an easier one for you to even remember. You remember what they sounded like. You remember exactly what they said, probably. You remember how the room was set up. And uh, you probably even remember how the room smelled. That's just how tender and how impressionable we are when we're small. In the book, Just a Minute, I actually tell the story of Adolf Hitler. Uh, there's a guy, I won't tell the story, but at age 11, he went from choir boy to monster in a moment of abuse from his father. It doesn't forgive what he did, but it makes it predictable and it actually makes it understandable that he would say never again nobody ever is going to laugh at me belittle me ever again so my challenge uh, to all of you I know you're professionals uh, but you've got kids in your own life and I would challenge you tonight when your head hits the pillow ponder back on the kids in the life start with the ones that you put to bed at night they know your, you know their love language better than anybody. Uh, what do they need to hear from you? You men, I can guarantee you, you don't say, I love you, I'm proud of you, enough. You never stand so tall as when you stoop to help a child, guys. Then the ones that are in your life on a regular basis, maybe at church or uh, in a little league game uh, team that maybe you coach, what do they need to hear, actually hear from you to launch them? And then lastly, uh, be ready for the one-timers that you'll never see again. You know, I lead a $640 million organization. I wear a Mickey Mouse watch. Part of it is to not take myself too seriously. The other part is every time I look at my watch, I remember that I'm about children. And I look around, where is a child? And is there anything I can say or do? Even just a little wave or a little applause uh, that might lift them up. And if there are no children, I just pause and breathe prayer for children. I encourage you in the midst of the battle, and I know that we are fighting things that are systemic, uh, but in the midst of the battle, join us in this battle for every single child that God brings across your path. So, where do we go from here? What does the, uh, does the future hold? I think that we have to be realistic enough to know that the plight of children, the problems of children in our world today uh, are, is not going to totally go away. Uh, we will have as the single most important need in our world is the care of our children. We have to be realistic enough to know that there is in fact a spiritual battle over our heads for these kids. Satan is like a roaring lion going about seeking anyone he can devour. He's got all the time in the world, all the patience in the world, uh, and he uh, is looking for the weakest, the smallest, the most vulnerable. He always has, and I think we have to be savvy enough to know that he will continue to do that. But I have worked with children now for 35 years. I have traveled the world in the context of compassion. And I can tell you this, it's beginning to change. People are beginning to awaken. Governments are beginning to start to take responsibility for the, the children that are entrusted to them. More and more countries are beginning to realize it's true what my village knew long ago. The children belong to all of us. I'm watching people beginning to vote with children in mind. 
uh, trying to not totally mess up the finance, asking them to pay it off, starting to care for our environment, which ultimately they will inherit. I'm beginning to see movement across missions who are understanding that children matter, across churches that are making children a priority. So I, for one, having been a lifelong warrior for children, I'm encouraged with where it's going. I am encouraged that you're gathered together doing what you're doing. How I would love to have had a group of people like you talk about abuse of children back when I was a little six-year-old being horribly abused and no voice, nobody fighting on our behalf. So can I just say thank you? Can I thank you for your heart? Can I thank you for taking the intellect that God entrusted to you, the power, the authority, the influence, and focusing in on the most precious part of the kingdom of God, his, his little ones. And I was one and you were one. We all belong to our Father. So let me encourage you, start with your own children, love them extra special today and do not grow weary in well-doing. If you read to the end of the book, we win. The kingdom of God prevails. And we get up there and a little child shall lead us. So stay strong. Thank you for the battle. God bless you.